Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. How are you doing? Today, we're going to be talking to you about growing your app on GCP. First, I'd like to introduce Aja. Aja is a developer advocate. Uh, Aja loves Ruby, dinosaurs, robots, and of course, cats. And this is Miles. Miles is a developer advocate on the cloud team with me. And he's also the director of the Node.js Technical Steering Committee. And he loves music and getting dim sum with his tech friends. In fact, earlier this week, we stumbled across dim sum randomly on the Google campus. And we had to pause our rehearsal so we could have dumplings before we could continue. I ate them all. <laughs> so we've spent mo part of our careers at startups for both of us. We know what it's like taking an idea into production and then growing it and adapting it as your user base ch shifts. We know that picking the right tools for the job at the right time is a balancing act of costs versus benefits versus skill sets. And today we're here to show you that the Google Cloud Platform has products that will work for you no matter what phase you are at and what your current struggles are. So once upon a time, there was a startup. <laughs> Catfax. Has anyone heard of Catfax before? Raise your hands. It's a few of you. We might be old, Miles. Yeah, this might be an old joke. Catfax is a service for getting facts about cats. <laughs> so some quick facts about our Catfax app. We already have an MVP. We're running on some provider somewhere in a VM, because originally we were running on my laptop. And we've got some OS, and the database and the app are all running in that environment, because that's how I had it on my laptop. And we're using Node, because Miles. Uh, and we're using some NoSQL database, because I don't want to deal with having to keep a schema consistent and having to deal with the schema as we're rapidly iterating on this thing. And we're doing email integration through a third party, because I don't want to deal with email. So like cats, the VMs that we use are a little temperamental. We only have one at a time. It's very precious. But it also you know, can get kind of angry if you try to pet it too quickly. And we really have to take care of it. There's no real rooms when you have a single virtual machine uh, for errors. So Miles is going to show us quick what the MVP looks like, because most of you are not familiar with the joy that is Catfax. So, so as you can see here, we have Catfax. You're going to sign up for Catfax with your email address. I'm going to make one up, oh my god, cats.biz, at oh my god, cats.biz. We're going to submit it. Now, once we've submitted it, we've subscribed to Catfax. We're going to get a response letting us know that we've successfully subscribed. And then every single day, we're going to get an email with a new fact and a new cat, with a new cat fact. Back to you, Aja. Thanks, Miles. So our Catfax app wants to move to the cloud. And we're going to be using GCP because we're here at Google I.O. So what are the reasons folks might want to move to the cloud and to GCP? One of the ones I hear a lot is that people's investors want them to. Investors are familiar with the cloud, and they know that it gives you a lot of flexibility to grow rapidly if your app just suddenly takes off. And it's also relatively easy to get an idea of what costs will be. The cloud is known, and people are comfortable with it now. Uh, you might also want to move to the cloud because you don't have an ops team. Our Catfax app, it's just the two of us. We don't really have an ops team. Uh, and you might want to move to GCP because you trust Google. You know that GCP is running on the same hardware and the same data centers where we run YouTube and Search and Gmail. And we keep those up, so we should be able to keep your app up too. So we have a VM. To run VMs on GCP, we're going to be using Google Compute Engine. This is Google's. Uh, VMs on the cloud service. And we can pick the exact combination of CPU and RAM that's right for serving our Catfax. And so I'm going to pick something that looks like my dev box, because I know that works. So if we want to move a VM over to a Google Cloud Platform, there's a couple different ways that we can do it. We can spin up a whole fresh VM and maintain it by hand and build everything up. Or we can try to find a way to orchestrate it. This can be through tools such as Ansible, Chef, or Puppet. Um, or you can have file system images that you move over. But it is going to be a manual process to move this over. So VMs are awesome, though. And there's a lot of things that I like about VMs. You have really fast startup time. So you could see from the t second that you spin up the VM, 
It's going to be about like 30 seconds until it's available and ready to use. And once it's running, it's available all the time. You don't have to worry about how fast it's going to boot up after that. Um, from that, you can make images and quickly boot up in the future at any time. You can also customize the specs. So you can customize how much memory you're going to have, how much CPU you're going to have, and you can really dial it in. If you need graphics cards, you can do that. So you need, if you need TPUs for doing TensorFlow, you can do that. It's extremely flexible. You can make it as big or as small as you want, and it's very familiar. So if you know, you know the Ubuntu environment or Windows Server, you can just get that spun up quickly and be working in an environment that you know. So there's a list of stuff to consider here. Um, we have to consider process management, security updates, upgrades. We need to consider scaling. Um, we have to be responsible for doing all of those security patches. If something bad happens, I don't know how many of you guys were working in the industry when Heartbleed happened, but I was working in consulting at that point, and that was a very frantic morning for us as we patched a whole bunch of VMs. You also, if you're dealing with VMs, you have to do backups, you have to do disaster recovery and provisioning. And you have to do database replication. And that's always been my least favorite ops task, is database replication. And our ops team is just the two of us. And we don't have the time to deal with all of that stuff. So we're going to move to highly managed services. And specifically, I want to start with the database, because I really don't want to do database replication. So we're going to move to one of Google's types of managed databases where we can get services like that and some of our disaster recovery uh, taken care of for us. Google has SQL and NoSQL options. We specifically have Cloud SQL in our, in our relational model, and we support both MySQL and Postgres. Uh, and if you have something that's very high throughput, you need to do a lot of writes, you need consistency, and you need to be global scale, we have Cloud Spanner, which is amazing. It can do so much stuff, and it almost violates the CAP theorem, but not quite. And then we have Data Store, which is our NoSQL, data, which is our NoSQL option. And that's actually what we're going to be using in this uh, demo. And then we also have Firestore, which is not on the slide, but is uh, part of Firebase and is very similar to Data Store. So now that we have the database moved over, we want to figure out where to run the application. How many people in the audience have used App Engine before? Quick raise of hands. Awesome. Awesome. So you know all the amazing benefits about moving to App Engine. But App Engine is our managed platform as a service. We love, Ashta we love uh, App Engine because there's no ops. Um, it has integrated data store. When you deploy on App Engine, you have HTTPS already ready for you. Um, you have idiomatic runtime. So I love this as a Node.js developer. I can write my Node.js app, I can test it locally, and then I can deploy it to the cloud. It's going to run exactly the way that I expect it to run. And if I need to run it somewhere else, it's going to just work. Um, also, all the container images that we use for App Engine Flex are all available on GitHub. So if you want to fork them, if you want to add to them, it's easy for you to do that. So now we've got someone else dealing with the operations of our app. And we demo for you, but the demo for showing it running on App Engine is nothing's changed. So we're going to skip that part. Um, so now we can factor out bits of our app and add new features, which is what I, as an application developer, really want to be doing. I want to make cool stuff. I don't want to deal with pagers. So first thing we're going to pull out is your app. our app mails you cat facts. And we don't really have to run the mailer in the front end on the same machine. So Miles is going to tell us about what we're going to do next with the mailer. So when we originally wrote this application for our MVP, we, as we said, we had everything in a VM. The database was in the VM. The single node app did everything. And this isn't super flexible. It's not going to scale nicely. It's not going to have nice abstractions. And it's not going to be reusable. So one of the first things that we decided to abstract out once we moved over to App Engine was our uh, CatFax as a service. So we were able to go. And maybe, Aja, do you, do you want to oh, yeah. get into and describe it? So what we're going to do here is I'm going to show you. So we moved all of our stuff to Cloud Functions, like Miles said. Uh, we moved a mailer, and we also moved some other stuff there. But the first thing we needed to do was to build out a function to get us cat facts. So this is some code to retrieve cat facts from the database and a picture to go with it. You can see we're just doing some really basic data store queries here. Because, and we're ordering on last used, only pulling one thing back. And I've got some code there to update a timestamp. And then we just send back a ba very basic JSON payload and a status code of 200. It really took only about 10 minutes to write this code. And most of that was remembering how data store and JavaScript work together. And Miles was talking about the email. So he's going to go into the code for the email and talk a little bit about how we approach that. So part of the reason why we decided to move the emailer to a cloud function 
was because email is not a service that is running in hot code. It's not going to necessarily affect the user experience. So and you saw the demo where I signed up with my email address. I want to get the response from the server giving me the confirmation that I've signed up. We do that once your email address is in data store. But once that's done, we don't need to wait for an email to go out to actually send a confirmation to the user. So we send a message out on PubSub to send an email. And we have this generic email server that creates a client and sends a request with the data to, that's who the email is going to, from, that's who is emailing it, the subject, and the body. And this can be actually reused throughout our application. So the exact same cloud function is running to send an email when you subscribe. And it's also sending an email every single day whenever new facts go out. And by, by splitting it out into a cloud function, it's able to scale up with our load as we have more people subscribing. It's able to be used for different things. And it's able to be its own code that we can think about independently. And if we ever want to change our email service, for example, we could just change the cloud function. As long as we adhere to the same API, the rest of the services don't need to change at all. And so we talked about adding new features. And one of the things I wanted to add was Cat Faxbot, because I really like chatbots. They're a lot of fun. And our team uses Hangouts Chat, which is super cool. And so I've written a Hangouts chat bot. And one of the interesting things is that both the mailer and the bot use the same underlying cat facts service. And all the Hangouts chat bot does is it reformats the facts and picture uh, payload into the form that Hangouts chat requires. All I have to do is call out to the, to the cat facts service, get a fact back, and then send back a 200 with the JSON package the exact way that Hangouts chat expects it. And I had a chat bot. It was really fast and really easy. And because it's running in Cloud Functions, if 100,000 people hit my, my uh, Hangouts chat bot to get their cat facts at the same time, it's fine. And if no one's using my, chat, my cat facts chat bot because no one wants cat facts right now, that's also fine. Cloud Functions will scale automatically to what I need at the time. And so I really like that because I don't know if cat facts is going to take off. Maybe people don't want cat facts in their chat bots. Mm -hmm. But Miles is going to actually show you that that chat bot right now. And you guys are going to see pictures of my cats. So here you can see we are in Hangouts chat. And we've got a chat going with the bot. And I could go like, hey, bot, give me a cat. And uh, the bot's going to think about it for a second. It's making a call to the cloud function. It's getting the data from the cloud function. And it comes back with a cat and a fact that each cat and owner have their own unique vocabulary. And we can message it again, hey, more cats plocks. And we give it a second to think about a new cat and a new fact. And it gets back to us uh. with the same cat and the same fact. And that's how you know that this is a real demo. <laughs> <laughs> back to you, Aja. So what happened there is we have, uh, we had a, I had a timeout. I did not actually sufficiently put enough time in my uh, chat bot to do the update on my query, because we're trying to pull the least recently used. Uh, I spent some time debugging that yesterday, but I'm sorry that you guys saw the broken version. But yes. you know, it's real. Uh, so Miles is going to talk a little bit about the architecture that we ended up with. Uh, and then we're going to talk about one of the last compute options you have available on GCP. So we've been talking through all these different services, but we thought that this diagram would kind of give a clear idea of how we architected it. So we have an, a front end that's written in Node.js and Express that's uh, running on App Engine that's taking user requests. And when you sign up, it's adding a user to Bigtable. And then it's requesting a cat fact from the cat fact function. And then it's submitting an event to, um, to PubSub to let it know to send an email. PubSub is then uh, triggering the function that's listening for new email events and emailing it out. Now, the task scheduler is another, is another App Engine app. Uh, if you didn't know, you can actually make cron jobs using App Engine to set it up to execute um, App Engine uh, rest calls based on certain amounts of time. So the task scheduler is set to run on a daily basis. Every single day, it gets the list of all the people who have subscribed. And then it sets a new uh, task in the PubSub queue for every single person to send them a new fact. The emailer goes and grabs the cat fact and sends it out. Um, what's really cool about this, too, though, is you'll notice that we have multiple services calling to the CatFax service. So we have the chatbot, which is also calling to the CatFax service. And we can build a whole fleet of services regarding CatFax, depending on the kind of uh, service you want to use to use it. We can make emailers, SMS, 
chatbots, IRC bots, and they can all use the same microservice that can scale up based on how much load there is. Maybe we find out that people don't like email anymore, and we need to pivot to SMS. We're ready to do that, and we don't have to do much refactoring to our actual architecture in order to support that. So at this point, let's just pretend that Catfax is the new hotness, and it is wildly successful, and we have hundreds of millions of users getting their Catfax and cat pictures on a daily basis. So if that happens, which we hope will happen, we're going to be able to hire someone to help us with operations. And when I've talked to my friends who work in operations, one of them said that we need to consider Google Kubernetes Engine. I was talking to her about it, and she said that it will give us more flexibility with our architecture while retaining many of the benefits of App Engine and Cloud Functions. And it would especially work well for us because we've already moved toward a microservices architecture with a bunch of different scalable components. So, so you may be asking yourself, what's a Kubernetes? Um, how many people in the audience have used Kubernetes so far? Okay. So you're not asking what's a Kubernetes. But for those who haven't, Kubernetes is, is the Greek word, I believe, for helmsman. Governor, Helmsman, one of those, I don't yeah. remember which. Yeah. Um, and it is a service that's um, open sourced. It's in the um, CNCF, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. And it's for orchestrating and scaling Docker containers in production. It's a way of setting up cloud architecture. And it's designed and based on the Google internal architecture Borg. So a lot of the lessons and things that we've learned about making scalable services were all used to inspire the architecture of Kubernetes. Um, on our next slide, we're going to show what a um, YAML file looks like for Kubernetes, and Aja is going to tell so you all about that. Here's an example Kubernetes deployment file for engin an Nginx container. The big thing to be aware of with Kubernetes, and this is the thing that a lot of folks find challenging at first, is that you do unlike when you're setting up VMs and you're doing scripting to make your VMs reproducible, all of that's focused on how. You want to install this thing, and then this thing, and then you want to change these ports and you want to set up this kind of load balancer. Kubernetes, you need to describe what a happy, wonderful, good state is for your product. This many versions of this container, this many versions of this container, this kind of load balancer. And then what Kubernetes does for you is it does everything in its power to keep that happy state. So if one of your nodes, magically, one of your VMs gets hit by lightning in the center of your data center, it could happen. Uh, Kubernetes will take what was running on that, v on that VM, on that node, and it will put it to other places in a way to make sure that your app is as close to that running state, that happy state that you want it to be. And it takes a little bit of work for a lot of people to get their head around the fact that you don't explain how to get there. You use the concepts that are built into Kubernetes, pods, services, deployments, to describe what a successfully running app looks like. Um, so Miles mentioned it a bit. In that example, I was actually using the Nginx Docker container. Uh, what, what, what's a Docker was one of the things that I asked when people were trying to teach me about Kubernetes. And Docker is a, contain, it is a container format. And a container is a way of packaging up a runtime and the files and the dependencies to go with it. And the nice thing about it is you can put multiple of them on a VM, and you don't have to deal with dependency conflicts. Like I know when I was working in ops, one of the things we had was we had like three different parts of the service, different microservices, and they each were using slightly different versions of various Ruby gems or slightly different versions of various C libraries. And installing them together side by side was a problem. And then we had to get like three different dev teams to actually agree on which version we were going to standardize on. With Docker, you can just package up an app with its dependencies and run it next to an app with slightly different or very different dependencies on the same machine, and you get much better utilization, and you get safety. The other nice thing about using containers and Docker is that since you're packaging a container, you seem to have less problems with the works in dev and doesn't work in prod situation, which I know I have spent many hours banging my head against. And when you read about this, you're going to see stuff about namespaces and C groups and all that. But the big thing is uh, running application with its dependencies and its file system all packaged up neatly. So what you can see up on the screen now is a fairly straightforward Docker file. Um, we're starting from an image that's actually published by the Node.js project. Carbon is the 8.x uh, branch for LTS. And if you go from Node.js Carbon Alpine, what that means is we're going to grab the latest published version of 8.x of Node running on an Alpine-based operating system. And Alpine is a very, very thin operating system that's been designed 
specifically for running in Docker containers. Um, if you're looking for fast boots and thin images, Alpine is a good place to get started. We're copying the file system from the folder that we're running in directly into the image. We're going to run the command npm install production. That production flag makes sure that your dev dependencies don't get installed. And it's important to run all of the commands to set up your environment before you're actually running in production. So this is going to make sure that all the dependencies you need are there, that there's nothing in that image that you don't need for running in production. And then the command npm start is going to boot everything up. So that command gets run when the Docker container is started. Um, npm start is a really great way to boot things up. It's something you put in your package JSON script. If anyone has more questions about kind of best practices for setting up Node applications, please feel free to grab me after the talk. So one of the things I mentioned in my definition of Docker is uh, C groups. And you might be thinking, what's a C group? And um, that's out of scope for this talk. So you can, you can come talk. We have con there's containers, office hours. And there's also office hours on Google Cloud's open source projects in the office hours space. And folks from the Kubernetes project will be there if you want to talk in detail about the implementation. So why would you make the switch to Kubernetes? This is the question I get the most when I'm out in the field talking to folks at events or I'm at DevOps meetups. And the first thing I want to say is you don't have to. There's a lot of folks out there who are like, Kubernetes is the new hotness. I have to use Kubernetes. And if what you have works for you, great. App engines, cloud, func App engine, cloud functions, or VMs, or any combination of those like we had with our CatFax app, they're a fine way to run your app indefinitely. If it works, don't fix it. But containers provide some advantages around portability, predictability, and utilization. And I've seen a lot of success with teams that have switched to this. The big thing that I've seen from my DevOps friends is that they're getting better utilization out of their VMs. They're able to use all of the CPU and all of the memory that they provision. It's less of an issue with GCP because Google Compute Engine lets you specify and make custom VMs that exactly fit your app. But if you have things that are really variable in load or you've got a bunch of VMs that all look the same for whatever reason, containers might be a way to solve that problem. And if you've decided to go with containers for any of these or other reasons, Kubernetes is a great way to manage the bin packing problem of putting things there and making sure that everything stays up. I really like that if you specify known good state, it will take care of making that known good state maintained for you, even if something weird happens to some of your machines. So some concluding thoughts about all the things that we just said. Google Cloud Platform is kind of like a delicious dim sum buffet. And bear with me on this. Um, you have lots of different options, and you can pick them all depending on your tastes. As you need more, they're there. They're on the cart. They're steamed. They're ready to go. You need more Sumai. We've got more Sumai. And it's really easy to share. You have big projects. You can add more people to the projects. They can grab the dumplings that they want. Aja, now I'm really hungry. <laughs> Um, almost so as you, lunchtime. Yeah, almost. as you can tell, I think almost as much about dumplings as I think about compute. But I also like to not have to think about how I make the dumplings. I just want to eat them. And that really becomes one of the great benefits about using a platform like this. If you need to focus on your MVP, if you need to focus on the product that you're getting out of the door, and your product isn't operations, you may want to be just using all these things that are ready to go. You can iterate off of them as necessary, and you can make architecture decisions to make sure that you are not super locked into things that are harder to move. But we have a lot of different products available for you today to run your compute in all sorts of different ways based on your needs. So we went through a lot of stuff really quickly. And one of the things I want to make sure everyone knows is that you, if you choose one of these things, it doesn't mean you can't change your mind later on. All of these things play well together. Projects that use a lot of them are here. Uh, here's kind of the high-level summary of what we just talked about. So we've got Google Compute, en Google Compute Engine. Virtual machines in custom sizes. I was talking to someone, and they had done the math, and there's over 6,000 ways, I think, to configure 6,000 different flavors of VM. Mm. Um, this is good when you're already familiar with VMs. Who's shipped something on a VM? I know I have lots and lots of times. Wow, that's actually fewer folks than I expected. Um, or if you just want to pick up something that you're running in a VM on your local machine and shove it into production. We have Google App Engine. This is a serverless application platform. It's good when you want a no-ops solution to running your app, and you want fully managed services. You want networking taken care of. You want auto-scaling. You want the ability to use uh, images that are known good that Google has endorsed, and we're making sure we're maintaining. We're making sure we're patching and things like that. 
We've got Google Cloud Functions for event-driven serverless applications or for event-driven parts of your application. This is good for tasks that need high scale some of the time and are largely stateless. It's especially good if you have something that you need to run a lot at once and not a lot later on. Because you can shove as much through that pipe as you need to or as little. It depends on what your use is, and it's really great for that. And then we have Google Kubernetes Engine. And this is managed Kubernetes on Google Compute Engine. This is absolutely one of the easiest ways to get started with containers and Kubernetes. This is how I got started, and it's really, really good because we take care of a lot of the stuff for you. While there's lots of folks involved in the Kubernetes project, both inside and outside Google, Google is still very involved. And the team that builds Google Kubernetes Engine works with the team that's working on Kubernetes to make sure that everything is smooth. So we want to say thank you. And before we actually say thank you to you all for attending, I would actually like to really thank all the folks who are making this possible. We've got fantastic staff running the lights and running the camera for the live stream and producing in this room. So if you all could give them a round of applause, I'd be grateful. And thank you all for coming and giving us you know, 45 minutes of your wonderful day today at Google I.O. I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.